Okay, so let's get started. Um, so you have um, heard about the post combustion and pre combustion capture this morning. And um, yesterday we discussed about the oxy fuel in PF mode and CFBC mode. That's another way of concentrating the CO2, recalling that you could concentrate only up to about 90 percent, right? So that is the limit uh, from all practical point of view. So there, so you have the post combustion capture, you have the pre combustion capture, then you have the oxy fuel, and from there, seamless, the oxy, within oxy fuel, you have the PF and the CFBC, and uh, that oxy CFBC then seamlessly transfers uh, across to chemical looping, which is another um, way of um, concentrating the CO2 capture. So I will keep it very brief because any questions that you have, you can ask this man who is working on chemical looping, right? Okay. So the, my task will be very easy, simple. Any question you ask me, I will divert it to him. Uh, you have lots of questions. You can ask it yourself and then get those answers. <laughs> That's your topic. <laughs> okay, no, I'm kidding, don't worry. Um, okay, so. Um, so the, um, one of the applications of chemical looping um, concept, obviously one is for CO2 capture and that um, um, is in general means potentially for power generation. But over the years, uh, the concept has um, evolved way um, more than, um, have diversified to more than just um, CO2 capture and power generation concept uh, to other areas which I have written here. So it has been extended to air separation, it has been extended to hydrogen production, it has been extended to a whole lot of chemicals production and I will touch on all of those ones, not uh, necessarily today but uh, tomorrow um, and of course mineral beneficiation. So some of those we will be touching but uh, before we go any further, let us uh, revisit uh, the um, the fundamental concept of chemical looping, which is already known to you. Okay. So, so what is it? It is that you have got two reactors, one reactor here which is a fuel reactor, the other one is an air reactor. The fuel reactor is like a reductor or a gasifier. And, um, but here you do not have any oxygen coming from air separation plant as you have in oxy PF or oxy CFBC. So no air separation plant business. So instead what you have, you have um, the fuel which can be coal or gas, coal or gas that needs to be reduced. So that is why it is a fuel reactor. It also has of course the oxygen is supplied to it not through air separation plant but through minerals, oxygen containing minerals and we will see what those minerals are, what people have um, researched and where they eventually have settled. So you have the fuel reactor here which um, gets to see a reaction between the fuel and the metal oxide. Let us concentrate on or let us focus our uh, discussion on solid fuels and in this instance it is coal but technically it can be biomass, it can be petroleum coke. Or for, the, uh, or, for, or for that matter any liquid fuel as long as it is a hydrocarbon that is um, that, uh, that weights to be reduced. Okay? So, 
So here what happens the, the, in the fuel reactor you get these sort of reactions and I will come to that in a bit more detail in the next slide. There is a reaction between the metal oxide MyOOx and the solid fuel. The solid, the metal oxide gets reduced to its lower valency form and goes to another reactor which is called air reactor. Okay. Um, and in the air reactor what happens? The reduced valency form of metal oxide gets reoxidized to its original valence form of MyOX and then it goes back to the metal reactor, uh, sorry the air reactor to carry on its function again of reducing the solid fuel. So if you then look at um, the what are the outputs from this, the outputs from this are predominantly carbon dioxide and water vapor and of course some of the emission. Uh, um, other trace emissions, the pollutant gases, etc. And from this reactor, a so called air reactor, the outputs are the reoxidized metal oxide and oxygen depleted air or nitrogen. There may be oxygen here if you are supplying too much air. Otherwise, you are getting predominantly nitrogen. Okay. So in a way this air reactor is an air separation unit, it can be work made to work as an air separation, air separator. This one is a CO2 concentrator. So these are the reactions that take place. In the fuel reactor you get um, the reduced form of the reduced form of the uh, oxygen carrier and then water vapor and carbon dioxide predominantly and the air reactor you get uh, the uh, reoxidized uh, yeah. but um, so this is a um, the traditional two reactor concept in chemical looping combustion yeah if you want to So if you want to then you can give it as well and we will come to that why and when you may require to give CO2 and H2 I mean the steam. Okay. But um, in its very basic form it is just the um, oxygen carrier and the, um, sol and the fuel. But the true reactor concept can also be um, also be um, extended to a three reactor concept. This time uh, the product from the third reactor is hydrogen. So you have the fuel reactor, you have the air reactor and then the from the fuel reactor what you can do is if you want you can run it not to the fullest stoichiometric uh, limit. Um, so that you get all of these gases or even if you uh, run it through the full stoichiometric uh, level then you may not like to get those just like to get this. But then the part of the uh, metal oxide reduced form of metal oxide can be further reduced by putting in steam and thereby getting hydrogen. So essentially you are if your oxygen carrier is such that it is not only capable of giving the oxygen to the solid fuel but also um, it um, is capable of giving um, uh, further um, uh, is, uh, is some of its energy to for water splitting then you get the hydrogen. So that one goes back to the air reactor, reoxidizes and then comes back again. So essentially you can extend it to hydrogen uh, generation as well. 
So now let's go to the next um, slides uh, for more, um, for the a bit more detail. So, so let's go to, uh, go to a little bit more of, uh, fundamentals uh, of it. So here you have the two reactors. So let's concentrate what actually happens here. Okay. So what happens here is that the, this is the coal particle. Okay. For the time being, let's assume no steam being given to it. Um, the coal, when it goes to a hot reactor, what happens? First thing, it, it's, it gets dried very early at 100 degrees mark, and then it gets paralyzed. And what are the products of paralysis we discussed the other day? Correct. So volatile matter. And within volatile matter, you have CO, CO2, H2, methane, etc. Okay. So that's why we have written here the volatiles. Those volatiles then go and attack the oxygen carrier. So it's not the solid coal particle going and attacking the oxygen carrier. It's the volatiles which are going and attacking the oxygen carrier. So it's very important that there are volatiles. But then what happens if some coals do not have much volatiles? Then you create those gases by this. Correct. So it will then create C plus H2O will give you CO and H2, which will then go through this red arrow, will then go and attack the oxygen carrier. So important thing to realize in oxygen chemical looping uh, combustion, unless you can create the volatiles somehow, either the coal itself is a high volatile coal or a gaseous fuel or you are generating through steam gasification or for that matter CO2 gasification as well. That's why that arrow had CO2 stroke H2O, that's why. So um, then this is eventually what will happen. So it will, those volatiles will go and strip off the oxygen layer by layer from the matrix of the uh, oxygen carrier particle. Assuming that it's a spherical particle, then we can, you know, we can apply the shrinkage core model or the grain model, whatever you call it. So, remember that. So the that uh, the most important thing is that the, the is the volatiles, which uh, convert the um, uh, the oxygen, which takes the oxygen carrier. Okay. So then, what happens to the carbon? Uh, then that carbon also has to be somehow uh, utilized. Of course, if you increase the temperature, then we saw in day one, second half, that the coal will give you more and more volatiles. Or if you give it more time at the same temperature, then also you can get more and more volatiles. Very important to remember that because then that means that you'd like to have the particles which can stay there for quite some time, not like in train flow gasifiers where in seven seconds they push, they run away. Okay? Um, so, um, so that's the uh, detailed concept of it, the, the, the fundamentals of it. Okay. So let's... Um, summarize everything that we have said through words. You have the solid fuels. When heated after drying, the volatiles go that way, directly reacts with the oxygen carrier. Char reacts, stays there and gasified, and which then reacts with the oxygen carrier. So it's a double whammy effect. Anyone can comment? Which one will be slower? 
combustion will be faster very good that's absolutely true then you have got the answer So how do you balance it? If you can balance in such a way that you know how much volatiles you will be getting from your coal, which you know, and how much oxygen is present in the oxygen carrier, which also to some extent you know, or how much oxygen can be scavenged out of the matrix, that also you know. So it's just a matter of balancing that out during your operational strategy. So anyone can comment on that? They are absolutely true. true. There is a gas solid reaction, then there is a solid solid interaction. Whether it is a solid solid reaction, I do not know. Let us try to find it out through discussions. Interaction and reactions are two different things. Interactions may be colliding, but not reacting. So, what is the solid solid reaction you are referring to? Then Which is pyrolysis. Yeah, pyrolysis and mm. Mm. Some time, uh, uh, it will take some time. No. What did I say pyrolysis is? Uh, yeah, pyrolysis is a, uh, very rapid. Correct. So, you have three reactions there uh, or three events happening. One is the pyrolysis which is fast not really determining. Then you have the volatiles attacking the um, oxygen carrier, gas solid, not sure how long it takes, we will see. Then you have the steam or CO2 going sent to convert the char, which we know is slow. So to answer your question, which is the slowest, we will find out. It, it cannot be the pyrolysis, it can be either the volatile oxygen carrier interaction or uh, reacting gas char and steam interacting with um, correct 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 will be right determining yeah, as we have seen um, diffusion is rather than the uh, surface reaction is often the slowest step. So, we, we will see that is the char steam reaction is really the slowest of the three steps. So, there are three steps here, uh, step number one, step number two and step number three. Amongst this, this will be the slowest. Okay. Does this make sense to you, Madam? Yeah. Good. Why? A volatile release, the coal particle has the entire reactor to give its volatiles. So, So, what is the problem? Give it, give, give lot of oxygen carrier. 
that is <laughs> it's not a problem. <laughs> but a good question, though. Good question, though. I mean, uh, um, correct. Uh, it will be slower than pyrolysis, whether it will be slower than the steam char gasification. Yeah. No, as soon as the oxygen is released, the volatiles get combusted anyway. So, volatiles actually do not know where the oxygen is coming whether you are supplying it from an air separation plant through a tube or it is coming from the uh, uh, oxygen carrier itself. As soon as the volatile see the oxygen, they will combust. Okay. It is good that you are asking this. That is why I said we missed you in the morning. Have been experimentally evaluated. Very well. Correct. Yeah. So, um, so to digress, I think that's a good question you raised, Dr. Dave. Um, there have been uh, experiments done with just char and steam, so avoiding the volatile uh, evolution thing inside the fuel reactor. So, just the oxygen constant, uh, oxygen carrier, char, and the steam stroke CO2. So, that way you could see which one is and then with the coal subtract one from the other you get this. So, this, is, this has been done people have already published their thesis on that. So, unfortunately you cannot have that chapter in your thesis anymore. Uh, Stuart Scott and others from Cambridge they have published it and the other people as well. I do not know, Is anyone can get started. Yeah. The question is, uh, this question is how do you ensure that the oxygen carrier is kept there for sufficient period of time? So, residence time. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. What else? Uh, what else? It is the density of the particle, is the size of the particle that ensures that, that that decides how long the particle will stay for a particular hydrodynamic condition inside a fluidized bed. So, when the, during the lecture on fluidized bed, if you could recall the fluidization velocity, bubbling velocity, circulating fluidizing circulating fluidized bed velocity, CFB velocity. These are all different regimes which determines uh, which de determines lesser and lesser and lesser time. So, if you give it very high velocity, it will not stay there long. If you give it just sufficient velocity over the fluid, the superficial velocity if you can recall that the term that was coined, then it will you can you are ensuring that it will be there. So, it is a fair bit of fluidization um, knowledge that also comes in, in here. Okay. So, yeah, so which one is first fluidized? Correct, absolutely spot, spot on. So, this one will be first fluidized because this one is combustion. Uh, I mean reoxidation. I mean it's very very fast. You don't need. So that's why you will see in the main photographs or CLC rig. This one is the large one. And the fuel reactor is the small one because you need to give more time to the fuel to give up its velocity. Is give up its? Huh? No. And then you have to react the carbon there as well, which will be the slowest. The fuel reactor will be the 
smaller one because that will give you the very least, sorry, uh, longest period of time, a kind of a bubbling mode. So when you said it's the first, he said this will be a fast fluidized bed, which means this will be the taller one. Oh, oh yes, yes. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, the actor height is bigger. So one will be tall and skinny. Uh, this one, the air reactor, the fuel reactor will be uh, fat and short. <laughs> That's a good description. Yeah. You think so? Why? I think that's correct, but the reason I'm asking is why? Sorry, why? Yeah, there you go. I'm learning. Correct. Correct. It's very good. So again, um, summarizing all the um, reactions there. Um, this uh, the the metal oxide is attacked by you know. CO or hydrogen gives you the reduced form. It can also be attacked by the uh, other product of devolved pyrolysis, which is methane, right? So these three, and then you have the um, others are also the conventional gasification reactions uh, that uh, give you more carbon monoxide, more hydrogen, which also go and attacks the oxygen carrier. So, hmm? how long the metal oxides will remain um, active? Yeah, we'll see. That's a big issue. That's a big issue. But they will not. Uh, they will not remain active for indefinitely. Right? Number of cycles. So let's see. So as I talk just now, uh, this uh, yesterday afternoon, my student uh, finished his 100-hour test in our looping reactor, which you will see. Um, and he was saying that after about 80 hours, he started seeing activity dropping, which means uh, that's the sort of thing. And it's under real uh, fuel reactor condition um, and air reactor condition. So it's a good point that you have raised. So let's let me take that one right now before uh, going to the next slide. So the fuel reactor, almost every reaction there, not almost every reaction there, is um, almost every reaction, not every reaction, that are endothermic. So the heat has to be provided somehow. So that heat is provided, fortunately by the heat coming from the air reactor because that reaction that takes place in the air reactor where the lower valency form of the oxidized uh, the uh, metal oxide gets reoxidized to its original form that's an exothermic reaction uh, in fact it's highly exothermic in fact the problem is other way around that it generates so much heat that it's more than what you need in the fuel reactor. Yes. Has to be. <laughs> no, by the combustion here. Mm. 
Will that be heat generation? Uh, do you utilize for boil? Correct. So it will be eventually it will be balanced, and if there is any unbalanced extra heat available, you extract it from here. So carbon is getting converted to carbon dioxide. That's the net objective. Correct, correct. But before that where the oxygen coming from and where the carbon coming from how which is endothermic so so uh, okay so let's dissect uh, your points you are saying the C plus O2, the last reaction from the fuel reactor is exothermic, Tick, correct. But the reactions that produce the carbon, that's endothermic in the same vessel. So these are all balancing each other. It's exactly the same way that um, uh, happens in a gasifier, that some of the reactions are endothermic, and therefore that endothermic heat is provided by uh, that endothermic heat is provided by the partial combustion or, or by the full combustion of some of the carbon. So that overall, in that reactor environment, everything is net zero, heat-wise. Okay, so, no, uh, no, sorry, where? In the fuel reactor, fuel reactor. Now it's um, some heat, a uh, lot of heat will be uh, evolved. So some of the heat, some of the heat are going together with the hot metal, no. Um, uh, yes, of course, hot, hot oxygen depleted air here. But the other bit of heat is carried away through using these metal oxides back here. Mm. Yeah. That will also carry some heat, obviously. And then you condense out the gas to take the water out, water vapor out, leaving behind only CO2. Now, the Yes, so the, the, what goes to the metal, uh, so what goes to the air reactor is the reduced form of the metal oxide. Whatever heat is remaining with it after being consumed by all these reactions here, after being sensible heat being taken, carried over by these two gases. So whatever remains and plus the losses, whatever remains then goes back in here, that's not enough. As soon as, it, but it is enough to get the uh, combustion going here as soon as it sees uh, oxygen from air. So overall, there is a balance between these two reactors. If there is any imbalance, usually it is on the positive side, that means excess heat available, that is taken out. Now this concept is the chem overall chemical looping, not yet. We are still learning. You will see. You will see.
We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. So we'll see. So we'll see. So keep this um, uh, question coming again in one of the uh, slides where I see multiple uh, oxygen carriers being tested and their oxygen donating capacity. So when I show that um, slide, ask that question again. No, no, <laughs> no. Uh, it, it. Correct. So well, where that goes is uh, you need to cool that gas to condense out the water vapor so that uh, oh, oh, from here that also comes out as hot gas, hot nitrogen and possibly with some excess oxygen. Um, so you can cool it and then you can release it, you can release it or you can use it for other purposes. So both of them work almost at this around the same temperature. One is around the 850 mark, the fuel reactor. Uh, if you remember, um, so I'll call, when I come to the choice of reactor, that's when we will discuss. But let me, okay, because you have asked the question, uh, because it's a, um, it's a kind of a um, reactor which should provide you long time. So it cannot be in, in train flow. And um, it, can, uh, it can be moving bed or fixed bed, depending on the type of the coal. But predominantly, it is fluidized bed. More or less, more or less. So if it is fluidized bed, as we know, that the temperature gradient, uh, temperature, yeah, the particle temperatures are obviously higher. But inside the fluidized bed, the temperature gradient of the gas is minimal, more or less. Mm. Because it has, it, do, it does not have any more oxygen left to be released. It has given it to its maximum form in the fuel reactor. Correct. Because in the air reactor, there is no volatiles in the air reactor. So in the air reactor, it is completely oxidized. So unless in the air reactor you are injecting some volatiles somehow, or then it will not be giving up its oxygen anymore. It will stick to its oxygen and go back to the fuel reactor in fully oxidized form and start giving its, donating its oxygen there. Actually, you know, they, I was going to discuss this in the next slide, so let's bring the next slide. Uh, so we have the chemical looping oxygen uncoupling, CLAU, uh, on the right side. And then on the left side, we have um, so-called chemical looping combustion. It is also called 
integrated gasification chemical looping combustion. So we'll come to CLOW a bit later. Let's first look at the left hand side one. Why it is called integrated gasification uh, chemical looping combustion is because gasification of the char happens because you are given giving these two or either of them correct. So the difference between this and this if you can look from the color coding you can decide that I won't give any steam. I will just give the CO2 which will give it um, only uh, release uh, maybe uh, from the, um, from the uh, oxygen carrier only uh, uh, the, uh, the oxygen because you are, it, it is, you are giving here what is happening is you are not uh, giving any steam to convert the carbon from the pyrolysis from the solid fuel. Here you are giving only CO2. The solid fuel is giving its volatiles which is going out and of course it releases a little bit of water vapor during the drying phase which also goes out from by the as shown by the left hand side arrow. But more importantly is the heat given to the oxygen carrier in absence of any extraneous steam that releases the oxygen and that is called oxygen uncoupling. So these two concepts are fundamentally different. In one you are converting the solid fuel by both steam and stroke or oxygen. In the other one you are supplying CO2 to do two things. One for the oxygen to be released. One for the solid fuel to give CO um, to be released and that um, and uh, the char then goes, gets um, uh, converted into uh, CO2 by the oxygen coming from the oxygen carrier. The point I am trying to make is what he raised. This one is if it is both then this C CLOW is actually incorporated here. So CLOW is an integral part of the normal chemical looping combustion as we know of. They can be same, say exactly the same type. Not, not every oxygen carrier can behave as CLOW and normal chemical looping oxygen carrier. Some are good at behaving at CLOW which will also be good for normal chemical looping combustion, but not the other way around. So it is, so what can be a good cloud um, oxygen carrier? The, the one which can release its oxygen quite quickly and quite easily. Uh, it is not to say that the gasification of the char is not occurring. Uh, this CO2 is also going and eating and giving you CO, but then that CO of, of course sees the incoming oxygen from the uh, oxygen carrier and eventually comes out as CO2. Correct. See, see, and, and if there is sufficient oxygen carrier available, um, uh, then that will also um, attack the carbon and then give you CO2. So it all boils down to how much oxygen is available, which boils down to how much oxygen carrier is, uh, is available. And in practice, the oxygen carrier is far in excess mass ratio wise far in excess to the coal that you supply 
So, so let me go uh, one step back first. Remember, in fluidized bed combustion or fluidized bed gas combustion in particular, I said that the bed material is the pre predominant part of the bed inventory. How much did I say about the coal is for five percent? Remaining ninety-five percent is um, uh, bed material. In CLC, is no different. Oxygen carrier is far in excess of that. Uh, so there is always more oxygen that is given purely to ensure that you obtain your desired objective, which is getting concentrated stream of CO2. Similar to anything that you do, similar to what you do in a PF combustor or CFB combustor, you supply excess air. Here you supply excess oxygen carrier so that you always get more oxygen than is necessary. Then, mm. in both in both cases, um, they evolve out in this almost the same manner. In in the second case. Uh, there is no steam. So there is no hydrogen do, um, uh, going there. It's simply because the, if there is hydrogen going there, then you have got some other problems. So if oxygen uncoupling is really the objective of the uh, process, not power generation, then the, this is how you will practice it. So oxygen uncoupling means oxygen, only oxygen being taken out from the oxygen carrier's matrix and um, sufficient oxygen is then kept. So that oxygen, part of that oxygen can be given to the char particle the, or to the coal particle and remaining oxygen can go out. Now it will evolve out but it will get immediately converted. So in the first case, your purpose is not to ha release too much of excess oxygen. There will be some excess oxygen going out. But if you want a situation where you want a lot of oxygen to be released, uncoupling it from the metal oxide, then the seg in the second, you will follow uh, or practice the second scheme. Correct, correct. So if you let's give you an example if you have if you have hydrogen and um, co mixed together and then put it over a heated oxygen carrier and then try to measure what comes out at the other end you will see that initially at a lower temperature co is still coming out that means in the competition between in the competition for oxygen between hydrogen and CO, hydrogen always wins and CO then whatever remains, CO then uh, does the job. So that's something that uh, is uh, done um, or found out through what is called temperature programmed redu reduction and I, I have a slide on that to show what that does to the oxygen carrier. You can do the hydrogen TPR, the TPR stands for temperature programmed reduction. You can do that with CO TPR, you can do that with hydrogen TPR, you can do that with CO plus H2 TPR. And then you will see what happens. Yeah. Correct. 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 So it is just two objectives uh, met in two different ways, but the principle is more or less the same. Reaction of CO and 
no it it will be in the gas phase it was so it will not be on the surface of the oxygen carrier because oxygen has been released and then so that will be release of oxygen release of oxygen is an endothermic reaction but the subsequent combustion is an uh, exo okay so uh, before we go to the next slide let me also say that be, um, because we supply so much oxygen carrier in excess so much oxygen carrier that heat has to be supplied by someone right and that heat is being supplied fortunately by the heat generated in the air reactor the whole mass of 19 times the coal um, uh, the oxygen carrier that you are supplying that generates enormous amount of heat part of the heat goes away with the nitrogen and oxygen part of the and the and the, and the loss from the system and um, uh, and the other part goes comes back into the fuel reactor okay. so next question is all the discussions that we so far um, uh, had from that we can ask ourselves the question so which solid fuels are most suitable I'm saying most suitable I'm not saying suitable the coals which have lot of volatiles in it low ash as well yes that's right low ash as well very good anything else so that means if you have hypothetical sake if you have anthracite which we said in day one that is very low volatile better not to because there is not volatile available um, uh, much volatile available to scavenge the oxygen so so you have said uh, low ash high volatile and that's precisely why we undertook our programs on low ash high volatile down coal so it's a very solid fundamental basis scientific basis uh, our coals have very little ash you can see forget about the chart um, very little ash but also if you could remember when you showed the proximate analysis in day one you were unfortunately not doing but anyway for your benefit uh, our coals have about 50 percent volatiles so so that's why we undertook this program and it's a big program okay so our volatiles are about 50 percent um, our and uh, on top of that we also have um, the uh, compounds of catalytic elements present which may assist in the uh, gasification of the char may but the downside is they have low melting minerals so you cannot win every every time uh, if there are low melting minerals then what can happen is those low melting minerals can deposit on the oxygen carrier rendering them difficult uh, so so uh, so there are issues so that's that's actually a an, an uh, area of investigation and that's why we undertook the 100 hour tests we first did one student did 35 hours continuous and then, then the next one um, is uh, just completed 100 hours to see what's actually happening to the bed material uh, the oxygen carrier if they are um, uh, losing their activity or uh, reactivity whatever you call it then why you can find that out later on okay so but uh, so these are the catalytic elements um, uh, which are present in our min as minerals in our uh, coal so so there is a so there is a solid basis or fundamentals for investigating this type of coal so their performance in the chemical looping combustion if it is a low volatile bituminous coal you will think twice biomass is another one biomass is good for chemical looping combustion on the surface or not 
one. Yeah, which which is also good. Yeah. Which is potassium. Good. Yeah. Good. Very good. So then the question is okay, which calls we know better? Then the question is which type of reactor? Is it fixed? Is it entrained? Or is it fluidized? Obviously, uh, it will not be the middle one for the fuel reactor. That's for sure. It could be that one, the top one, uh, or, or uh, that one, or that one. Depending on, if you can recall when we discussed about the fixed bed, the fixed bed reactors do not like coals which are friable because they like chunks, 50, 60 millimeter. And if they become um, uh, finer particles through attrition, then obviously channeling will occur and therefore they will not perform well. Okay? So it depends on the, uh, not only on the coal's chemical characteristics, but the physical characteristics. Um, uh, in our, for our coal, we realize very quickly that our coals attract very much and uh, degenerate into fines. Uh, they lose the, their, um, uh, they, lo they illutriate away and therefore, we will be much better off to use um, fluidized bed. So that's how you will select your reactor, depending on the physical characteristics of your core. So I would say we made this comment that for brown coal, our craft of coal, uh, fluidized bed is primarily uh, um, the uh, choice of reactor. Okay. So, let's go into a bit more in detail. Little ash, I mean still that can be quite a bit, but high volatile. Then you, you have to investigate. Yeah. Ash. So, okay, so um, because I was going to talk about that in another slide later on. In the fuel reactor, what will happen? The oxy oxygen carriers are going and coming back. And you are also generating ash there. Some of the ash, in all probabilities, is also going with the metal, reactor, uh, metal oxide into the air reactor and coming back. So even though it is 2% ash in our coal, but over a period of time, that 2% will be still a significant quantity. So the question then is, how will you separate, eventually how will you separate the ash from the metal oxide? Well, that's one way. The other one is that if you have um, the, um, there is something called a carbon stripper, which I haven't shown yet, um, which I will show. That's where you will be able to take majority of the ash out. The fortunately, what happens is that the density of the ash from the coal is way less than the density of the metal oxide. Almost 1,000 kilogram per meter cube difference. So that's a good density separation criteria. If those are close, then you would be um, in trouble. But fortunately, Mother Nature has generated, developed all the coals for us, for, for which the ash specific gravity is about 2.5, meaning the density is about 2,500. And majority of the oxygen carrier that we eventually have settled, they are in excess of 3,500. Some, sometimes someone helps you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. huh? 
till I have 3,700, 3.7, depending on what it is. So these are the front runners um, in CLC research. Uh, the Southeast and Hast, they are in China, and Tsinghua is also in China. That's where I'll be going on Friday, Saturday, sorry. Technical University of Vienna and uh, Darmstadt in Germany, Wilsonville in Alabama. Um, um, Canfield also started, but I'm not sure what status is then and they have. Right. I haven't seen many publications from them in that area. Calcium looping. Correct. Correct. For C in the, in the non-calcium looping area. Oh yes, but that's because they are one megawatt unit uh, was. Um, they have they have they have changed it. Chemicals only coming only now, uh, the concept. Now, for that, they are the, the um, for, for example, the other day we were discussing gas cleanup, the uh, regeneration of the spent solvent is nothing but looping. Just because someone did not use the term looping, but that is just looping. So, um, this all this work has predominantly a power focus, so that is my observation. Which is fine. Yeah. Uh, when I say power focus, no, uh, because produ producing power through steam turbine and gas turbine would be easy. First, knowing what happens in the air reactor and fuel reactor, establishing them well is really the key. The rest of the things are simple. So that's why I say that when you are talking about CO2 production, CO2 capture, it is invariably related to power. So that's why. Okay. The metal oxide which comes back to the air reactor, uh, 900. It can come also at a higher temperature, but the problem will be uh, the metal oxide can get sintered. Then what will happen, you will generate less volatile, then you have to convert more of the char through steam. if your temperature is low. So, the next bit. When Alstom was active, they, were, they are a partner uh, or were a partner in our recently concluded project, uh, CLC project. This is their vision. So, have a look at it and then ask me questions. Because I, I, I have no questions. So there are two reactors, and this is how they envisaged to put together and generate electricity. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so what is a uh, fuel reactor? One is an air reactor. <laughs> That's a good, good point. <laughs> the thicker you won't uh, necessarily realize that it, it's uh, it's uh, the eventually the velocity and the time that it requires. Yeah. Oxy, oh, more oxygen carrier, more oxygen carrier. 
but you also have more oxygen, same amount of oxygen carrier in the other one. Actually, I didn't notice that. That's good. So this is how they envisaged uh, integrating the two uh, reactors, which so far we have seen only as two boxes uh, in the block diagram. But this is what they said. Alstom was the large, one of the largest supplier of CFB, right? And uh, so they have CFB knowledge, circulating fluid with combustion knowledge. Uh, and um, they, have, they know how much bed material is put in CFB, which is no different from the amount of oxygen carrier that it will put. So they have that uh, expertise as well. And, um, and everything on the right side and everything on the left side is the same. So they said it is doable. Let's investigate really what goes on here and here. If we can find those th two things out, that allows, uh, that either creates no problems uh, the, or have problems that can be engineered out, then uh, the, the, uh, the technology will have prospect for uh, use in power generation, provided economics is met. Yeah, I think they are. They are this because this is a new technology, and the first few iterations of any technology, you want to keep as much um, flexibility as is possible. So ra rather than adding lines later on, if they see that the lot of metal oxides are also illustrating, and some of them which are illustrating so much that and also they have reduced their um, uh, valence form, then it might be possibly required to put them straight to the air reactor and shut this one out. So it's not that it, this will be the exactly the same configuration that would be followed, but in the first few cases, this is the redundancies they decided they would, it would be worth considering to have. Ideally not, ideally not, yeah, unless you give it very little time. So if you run one as a bubbling mode, that means it will get a lot of time to get hopefully converted completely closer to 100% CO2 yield if you, are, um, uh, if you are fortunate. If not, then obviously you will uh, bring the unburned carbon back or the unburned carbon will be sent to a box called char stripper, which he also mentioned the other day, convert it there. Uh, one thing is very sure, that you don't want any unburned carbon to go to the air reactor. Unlikely. Uh, who knows? This is this is uh, another unknown, which you would you would find out from experiments, tests, trials, etc. So, hmm? whether we will need the stack, I don't know. Maybe they, initial, they thought uh, initially you will run it at a, just as a CFBC com, uh, mode, um, establish everything and then gradually replace. That's a starting st startup strategy and then gradually replace the, um, start running it as a um, um, uh, CLC mode. And then you won't require the uh, stack there. But if the stack is there, then you can, you can use it during the startup or during the low load. Not yet. Yeah, yeah. Intention is to have it. 
conceptual. So what are those heat exchangers? During the startup, for example, you still have to remove the heat. And, and in fact, in, the, in excess heat, you, will, you may have to remove anyway. So have it there. Um, not easily a tritable, no. Compared to sand, yes, more compared to sand, at more attritable, uh, but definitely not as attritable as coal. If someone else was asking another question. Oh, even in the CFB, uh, with five percent carbon go coal going, it's still effective for power generation. Six hundred megawatt CFB units. Uh, compared to the in, uh, in there, compared to the bed material, this, uh, uh, the uh, car coal going in is only five percent. Still effective for power generation. No, no, no. In the fuel reactor, the total heat that is required. So, some part, okay, the total heat required in the fuel reactor is provided by the heat coming back with the metal oxide and some heat from the combustion of the exothermic reactions that take place. How? So, if you provide more coal, if you provide more coal, then you will run it predominantly as a gasifier. Your objective is to get eventually CO2 and water vapor, not CO and hydrogen. So if you provide more coal, you will get CO and hydrogen. You can do, you can, you can do that. That is what is integrated gasification CLC, integrated gas, gasification CL. You can generate hydrogen as well if you want to, but if your focus is on CO2 capture, then your ob your intention is to not intention. Then your overall objective is to create a concentrated stream of CO2 so that you can sequester it. Which one? The metal oxide, the metal oxide, uh, because it has to be deoxidized. That's why. Yeah. So, um, if um, if some metal oxides are separated out by the cyclone and not going to the fuel reactor, they have to go somewhere. The only where somewhere that they can go is the ideally is the air reactor. And they will not do anything. They will not get, if they have been already been oxidized, they will not be uh, creating any problems. They will just be circulating. And if they get sintered and become larger, then obviously they will, they can be taken out from the from the bottom of the air reactor. Hmm. Yeah. So, so in this one, in this one, they did not envisage any carbon stripper uh, when they first uh, uh, conceptualized uh, that how this will be required. So, don't try to read any more than um, uh, this. The, the intention for this type of diagrams to show to the engineers and the decision makers is that look, it is not a brand new technology of everything requiring 
um, uh, research. Fluidized beds are the choice reactors. We know that. We have expertise in that. Fluidized bed gasification is, is required in this, and we know that. But then the other nitty gritties, how much carbon can go this way, how much carbon can go that way, those will all come from research. And that's why research in so many universities, so many uh, institutions, uh, research institutions are taking place. Don't take the view that this is the final form of the uh, power um, um, cycle. Okay. Sorry? Any operational experience in high temperature reactors will be helpful. The only thing is FCC, the uh, uh, circulation rate is much, much higher. There is because very high velocity. Cool. I will see that. Take a break. Maybe immediately after this, because it looks like I will have the uninterrupted time. I have scared away <laughs> five individuals. Huh? Yeah, so I, I, I will be spending as much time because there won't be present. There, there will be one presentation by someone or not? Or all the presenters have disappeared, I think. All of them disappeared. Okay. So anyway, so let's um, show this. Um, let's show this. Um, so here, the only new thing that I have shown in here is that you still have the fuel reactor, you have the air reactor, and everything else. Um, and um, don't worry about this once for the time being. Um, the fact that fuel reactor may not give you 100% carbon conversion, when people started realizing it through experiments, and given that that carbon cannot be allowed to go here, because your objective is to get nitrogen, not nitrogen plus CO2. All the CO2 has to come in here. So what they decided, OK, we will put a box, which is called carbon stripper. So these are some of the developments that take place once you have conceptualized, tested, identified the um, uh, issues, and then engineered those issues, those problems out. So this is a classic example of that. And that's why I have put it in here. Okay. It was not there in the previous slide. It was not in there in the previous slides at all. Okay. So this is how research evolves. This is one classic example that you carry on. And then you find out what are the known problems which you solve them. But then this is one unknown unknown problem which became known, as soon as it became known, then they decided, OK, we'll have to have another measure. That's it. Okay. So let's come back after the. No, because they unburned carbon. Yeah. 